Hello and welcome to our e-seminar presentation, Balance Related Case Reviews, presented by Dr. John Peters. I'd like to introduce Dr. Peters. Dr. Peters earned his PhD from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia as part of a series of clinical and research studies focused on changes in brain electricity and human behavior. John joined Neurocom in 1988 to work with Lou Nashner on the clinical and research applications of computerized dynamic posturography, including the development of InVision, head shake sensory organization, and postural evoked response protocols. John retired as the Vice President and General Manager of Neurocom in early 2012. Without further delay, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Peters. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so this morning's presentation, we're going to focus on some case examples that illustrate the use of uh, computerized dynamic posturography and associated protocols. I'm not going to talk about actual performance of the protocols or the essence or of each assessment by itself, but rather focus on the results of each of these and how that information can be used to tie into the dynamic equilibrium model and develop a set of objective data to be used to, to manage uh, these cases. So the first, uh, the next slide then is an excellent starting point when one thinks about case studies of any kind. And this is the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, or the ICF. In all of these cases, we have some type of a health condition, disorder or disease. We may or we may not know what that is. In many cases, we will because we'll see essence, occurrences of the diabetic neuropathy, post-stroke, um, lumbar, lower motor uh, issues, and so on. But in some, uh, they'll be virtually unknown. Those result in changes in body structure and function, which then leads to activity limitations, which leads to participation restrictions on the part of the patient in their activities of daily living. To that, we need to weigh in environmental factors and personal factors. But in order to design up a program that will allow us to take care of the activity limitations and participation restrictions, we really need to focus back on what body systems and the function of those systems are or are not responsible for those changes. So with that thought in mind, we'll go on to look at the dynamic equilibrium model, which we've reviewed in the past. It's one put together by Dr. Nashner several years ago, which allows us to look at the sensory and motor aspects of the balance control. If you look at this kind of a feedback, continuous feedback model, it's very easy to see that you can split it right down the middle. You have a sensory side to the equation and you have a motor side to the equation. On the sensory side, you need to be concerned about environmental input or environmental interactions through the visual, vestibular, and somatosensory systems to the central nervous system, which uses that information to determine where the body is in space. On the basis of that information, the brain then will initiate either automatic movements of the motor system or voluntary movements in terms of making a decision to do something on the part of the patient, such as initiate a step to walk across a room or to reach out and pick something off of a shelf. That results in a series of motor contractions to generate the body movement. So we will very simply look at each of these from a system standpoint. We're not going to be concerned about where a piece of information might be uh, problematic within a system. For example, is there a lesion in the vestibular system or is it a right or left vestibular deficit? All we want to know is are those systems creating or contributing successfully to balance control? And similarly, whether or not the motor system is functioning appropriately. The first example we're going to look at is one that takes compares two patients, A and B, both are elderly gentlemen in their 70s, reporting with mild dizziness, 
which is resulting in increased imbalance, and, and not uncommonly in the elderly, all co also decreased activity levels in activities of daily life. They also have an underlying problem of diabetic neuropathy, which on the surface appears to be quite similar between the two gentlemen. If we look at the overview of this, then we need to know what is the impact of that peripheral neuropathy on their balance control. Is it the same for both, or is it worse in one than the other? Are they developing some possible vestibular deficits that is leading to their definition or report of a symptom of mild dizziness? To do this, we're going to use classic computerized dynamic posteography. The first slide here then shows the sensory organization test results. Very similar for both gentlemen in the overall finding that they have difficulty standing on conditions five and six, where the eyes are closed in condition five and a sway reference surface, or a sway reference surface and a sway reference visual surround. You'll notice also that patient B has a little bit of difficulty when the eyes are closed even on a stable surface. So there may be some evidence here to say that their, use, their ineffective use of somatosensory cues is causing them slightly more difficulty than is found in patient A. The real lead into that then is when we look at the motor control exam, where we're actually challenging the motor side of these patients in order to maintain their balance by sliding the platform back and forth underneath their feet. In the case of patient A, both the left and the right leg respond fast enough and effectively enough to regain balance control. Patient B, on the other hand, shows delayed responses, particularly in the right leg, to backward translations. So this is telling us that although both of them carry a diagnosis of peripheral neur diabetic neuropathy, that the impact of that is much worse in patient B than it is in patient A and therefore is going to impact their balance control to a significant extent. In terms of looking at the adaptation test, simple toes down where the floor is slowly dropping out from under the patient, you can see there's a mild impairment in the first patient they do balance reasonably well on the first two trials, but they don't really adapt that response in the last three. It's a critical finding, but it is not anywhere as near as severe as what you see in patient B, where they do not adapt at all to that toes down rotation of the platform. So that information in conjunction with the motor control information is telling you that the peripheral diabetic neuropathy in this patient is having a much more significant effect on their balance control than in patient A. Further follow-ups then, an ENG on patient A confirmed a partial bilateral loss, but patient B no response to ice water calorics bilaterally, significantly more impaired vestibular system. In addition, the EMG nerve conduction velocity studies confirmed further deterioration of peripheral neuropathy. So now when you go to the balance side of this and the management side of these, both could use some vestibular rehab, but clearly with this kind of a loss bilaterally, a lot of vestibular rehab is not going to gain you a tremendous amount of impact here, not to the extent you would see it in patient A. And balance retraining is, of course, necessary. So for B, you're going to focus on lifestyle issues <clears throat> and balance training issues. Both of the balance programs need to continue on with some overall activity level increases in order to make up for their basic sedentary lifestyles. So very similar histories, very similar physical exams can lead to completely different outcomes on these data sets, and you need to be able to <clears throat> excuse me, effectively apply each piece of that puzzle in terms of the dynamic equilibrium model to sort out 
whether it's just more a sensory issue, more a motor issue, or a combination thereof in a given patient management issue. The next case is a 73-year-old lady with a seven-month history of dizziness with movement. She had one fall when walking across her yard to water her flowers, and as a result of that, she's become the classic wall walker. That is, she seeks artificial support at all times when she's moving about. Otherwise, her past history is non-contributory. She's perfectly healthy, functioning individual. With the negative history like that, we really now have to look ser- hard at to find what the possible deficits are that are leading to that functional loss of her mobility in terms of now being forced to be a wall walker. So we approach this one again using computerized dynamic posteography and video nystagmography. The SOT results in this lady are very intriguing because although you see in the summary of the data that she did fall six out of six times on conditions five and six, where here on five, eyes closed, sway reference support, here on six, eyes open, sway reference surround, sway reference support. But if we look at the raw data, we see that those falls occur late in the trial and after she has indeed regained her balance control after she's displaced her center of gravity significantly. This kind of a finding is very positive in terms of supporting the outcome of potential rehabilitation. She shows the ability to manage her balance up to a critical point where she finally just sort of loses it, so to speak. So this lady should um, gain a lot from vestibular rehabilitation and balance retraining. That's further bolstered by the fact that her motor control data is perfectly within normal limits. Very good responses, symmetrical in terms of onset latencies, good reliable findings, no issues there at all. Her adaptation scores, however, present a slightly different picture. So she does have some inability to control her balance when toes up and toes down. She's probably got a little bit of a musculoskeletal issue going on here versus a cerebellar impairment because her motor control data is perfectly within normal limits. So the probability of a cerebellar issue on her is relatively low. We can examine that just a little bit further by looking at her ability to control her limits of stability. And we can see that even when she tries to start from a centered position, that her ability to move out to the targets is impaired in all dimensions, although laterally she does a little better than definitely in the anterior direction, and posterior presents significant challenges to her. So she is going to have balance problems controlling herself once she moves outside of her comfort zone and the ankle data that you see in the adaptation test are going to exacerbate that. Her VNG was negative. Her sensory organization test raw data, the adaptation and limits of stability provide critical information to say that the best approach to her is rehab in the anterior posterior range of motion progressing up to working on unstable surfaces so that the outcome for this lady is actually quite positive. She should be able to get away from the wall walking uh, response without any difficulty at all. So we've seen how combining CDP but expanding it with other test protocols such as the limits of stability establish the issues and focus the the therapy programs. So it's critical to remember that you can't use just one single test. You cannot rely on a single piece of information here. Think back to the model and recall how you need to expand that out to split up that patient's performance into those categories of sensory, voluntary motor, involuntary motor, 
and then put that picture back together again. Here we have a 66-year-old female with a 10-year history of chronic low back pain. She's had a lumbar disectomy, discectomy, sacroiliac and lower limb orthopedic issues, some cardiac problems. But in spite of this type of history, she is considered to be medically stable. So the real question then becomes one of why isn't she making any further progress in her rehab programs? Is poor balance aggravating her pain issues, or is the reverse the issue? Are her pain issues aggravating her poor balance? So we'll focus on computerized dynamic posturography here again, but adding in more voluntary motor control programs. When we look at her SOT results, again we see that she falls on all six conditions of five and six, but when we start examining this in light of her balance strategy and her center of gravity alignment, we find some in interesting information that would lead us to believe that there may be biomechanical issues in here that are more important than a, perhaps a vestibular deficit. For example, her center of gravity is very badly biased in the anterior direction. Not at all uncommon finding in the elderly who have an inherent fear of falling over backwards. So this would contribute to these falls. Anytime she becomes a little bit unstable, she has no safety zone to follow through here. Her balance strategy is also inappropriate. It's mixed. Part of the time it's reasonable being ankle-based. Part of the time it's hip-based. And then when she does fall, <clears throat> even, excuse me, even though she shows a shift to a hip movement, it's not sufficient in order for her to regain her balance control. Her limits of stability are very scattered. She's not afraid to move. Her reaction times are good. She can move fairly quickly, but she doesn't move very far. This is the interesting part. So she is closing up her limits of stability, which is going to make her balance control in the face of that posterior lean in her center of gravity even worse. If we look at her rhythmical weight shift, that is her ability to follow a target left to right and anterior to posterior, which are basically the components of walking. If you can't rhythmically shift your weight left to right to weight and unweight a leg, you cannot pick up that back unweighted leg to move it forward, and then you have to be able to shift your weight in the anterior-posterior dimension to follow through with that step and continue walking. Moving in the horizontal dimension is not that big of an issue for her. However, when she's moving front to back, you do see significant constriction of movement again, very small range of motion, and very poor directional control as well as very poor velocity. So her COG alignment issue and her inability to move in the anterior-posterior direction is a major factor in her balance issues. Her limits of stability is severely restricted and she has poor rhythmic weight shift as well. So the classic approach to managing her first is to realign her center of gravity to gain core stability. This is the old adage of working from the outside in. If you don't get her center of gravity aligned in the beginning, all of the balance exercises that you give to this lady will be done in an off-balance position. So you're going to be fighting against yourself. You can then add in random surface challenges to get her to use other sensory cues to make up for unstable or unreliable somatosensory information, and then add in some mobility challenges to keep her moving and keep her walking. The next one is a case with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and a subsequent complaint of disequilibrium. He's otherwise medically stable, and his complaint of imbalance comes about post-canalith repositioning. 
This is not that uncommon. There's been some several publications in the recent literature, most notably that of Herdman, which has shown that uh, post-BPPV maneuvers, once the BPPV is resolved, the patient has now balanced complaints. One way to think about this is you've got a vestibular system that's been feeding the brain false information for years. The brain has developed preventative or compensatory mechanisms to control its balance in order to fight that, such as preventing head turning or unwillingness to turn the head in given directions. Once that BPV is resolved, however, then those secondary mechanisms no longer have anything to fight against, if you will, and now you have a balance issue that's induced as a result of those problems. So the question, is there a residual canalith dysfunction and what are possible additional secondary impairments? So we're going to induce, introduce some new approaches, dynamic visual acuity, and something called a head shake sensory organization test. We want to see what happens to this patient's balance control once they start moving their head purposely. The actual sensory organization test itself, the classic, shows only a couple of falls, again with reasonably normal findings, otherwise on conditions five and six. So this is demonstrating that this patient can in fact control their balance in the majority of situations, but the challenge can be um, detrimental in certain respects. The dynamic visual acuity test, working only in the horizontal dimension, showed normal findings. That is, they only, the patient only lost 0.2 logmar of visual acuity, despite the fact that they were moving their head at 145 and 147 degrees left and right, well within uh, normal performance. However, when you then take that patient back to the sensory organization test and now ask them to do a head shake in the vertical dimension on conditions two and on condition six, you find some very surprising results. On condition two, the eyes are closed, the platform is fixed, they maintain the appropriate head velocity, as you would expect, and they maintain very good balance control. The actual loss is only about 10 points on that condition. However, when they go to condition five, where the eyes are closed and the surface is unstable, now you see that they don't always maintain appropriate head movement velocity. So they're reducing head movement in order to maintain balance, but even at that, at this velocity, it's ineffective. So you've got a clear demonstration here that this patient still has residual issues tied to the head movement that are going to be very destabilizing and need to be managed in terms of their overall balance control. So balance exercises with head movements in the vertical plane are what need to be instituted with this patient in a very progressive manner. So they start out with minimal instability of the support surface, basically mimicking condition two of the SOT, and then building that unstable surface further and further until the control is there at maximum velocities. And at that point, this individual should be able to return to a productive lifestyle. What about a patient who has a long history of cerebrovascular accidents? In this case, a 70-year-old male who's had a left medullary stroke. He has difficulties walking, and as a result, he's restricted his daily life activities. Not surprisingly, in this case, the Berg balance and dynamic gait scores are within normal limits because they've plateaued out. He's recovered as best as he possibly can on those dimensions. What is the impact of his deconditioning? He's reduced his activity, therefore he's going to have lower extremity strength loss that's going to tie into his hemiplegia. And we need to see where 
those fit in the realm of his balance control. The sensory organization test for him is not that unreasonable. There are some scattered examples of his falling on the first two trials of condition five, but he subsequently masters that task very well so that there can be some very good possibilities here that he will show excellent progress with some vestibular rehab. And this is very critical because a lot of patients who suffer cerebrovascular accidents also end up with significant vestibular losses. In his case, he is compensated reasonably well there, but work needs to be done. His balance strategy, for the most part, is excellent. He is a little bit ankle-oriented. His center of gravity is reasonably well aligned, but he does have a little bias over here on the left. The motor control data, however, tells a completely different story. The right leg clearly is not as responsive on backwards and forwards movements. We know that he doesn't have any biomechanical issues, and this would tie in with the left medullary uh, stroke problem. He stands reasonably symmetrically, so it's not an unweighting issue. He will use both legs to support himself, but the right one just does not have a significant amount of, of power in it. The amplitude shows that as well. The left leg responds a little bit harder than the right on backward translations, but there, and even on the forward. So in an incidence where he is balance challenged, this left leg, because it generates more to force, is going to have a tendency to spin him off to the right over the weakened leg. His ability to voluntarily control his balance is also weak on the right. He moves very little on the right side. His movements to the left, although better, are still a bit on the erratic side, so further workup is needed to solve those issues. We've seen then marginal problems on his sensory organization that does recovery recover. We see that his motor control has prolonged latencies on the right, as it would be expected. LOS, difficulty on the right, and rhythmical weight shift, difficulties in the posterior direction. So we need to customize a rehab program focused on improving vestibular interaction and get him into some real treadmill and yoga perhaps to improve overall conditioning, focusing on his ability to use and move effectively to the right. And the next case study is a young man, 47-year-old healthy male, who's a high iron worker who has concerns about intermittent safety and dizziness at work. Because he is working high iron, it's very critical to him that he be able to move safely in that environment. A previous ENG had shown a minor unilateral weakness. So what will happen if, if he goes up on those heights, if he moves his head wrong, or if he does become a little bit disabled up there, obviously falling is a major issue in his life. So we want to see what happens with active head movements. Dynamic visual acuity for him does show a significant loss in visual acuity, almost three logmar. In fact, with head movements of 125 degrees per second, which is well within the testing range that you need. The responses are reasonably symmetrical. But if we go to movements in the vertical direction, or I'm sorry, in the horizontal, the previous one was vertical, we see a major change with gaze stability. And that is he cannot move his head to the right nearly as fast as he is willing to move his head to the left. So he slows himself down, so any reactions requiring that sort of head movement are going to be an issue. His sensory organization test is a bit inconsistent. Overall, it's well within normal limits, so these are very minor findings. 
The real issue is what happens to him when he moves his head. Here we have him doing a head shake sensory organization test in the horizontal direction. He maintains excellent head velocity. On condition two, eyes closed, fixed support surface, he loses very, very little stability. On condition five, with the eyes closed and a sway reference surface, again, he loses some stability, but not nearly as much as you might expect. So we repeat the exam, moving his head in the vertical dimension, which in the construction trades, walking the iron is going to be very critical to him. And again, we see in the vertical dimension, his loss of equilibrium is minimal, good head movement velocity, but with the eyes closed on condition five, he falls repeatedly on the all trials. And so the exam was stopped after the fourth trial. There's no point in going forwards. So it's confirmed we've got an incomplete vestibular compensation issue here that's aggravated by vertical head movement, but the prognosis should be very good for this individual with VOR exercises, particularly balance and balance-related exercises involving vertical head movement to tie them as close as possible into his working environment. So what we've done here is try to illustrate that there's no one single test that fits any one of these cases. You need to bring in impairment and functional protocols, combine them to build the best picture so you can take apart each of these cases in terms of their sensory and motor control of balance, understand what's happening at the systems level with these cases, and put all of this back together again in order to build up a complete rehab picture. And very detailed analyses of each of these cases um, are available in written form uh, from Neurocom, and so you can contact them directly to read each of these cases in full detail. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peters, for that uh, very detailed and informative presentation. As Dr. Peters mentioned, you can find these cases and other archived presentations at www.onbalance.com. This will conclude our presentation for today. We'd like to thank you for joining us. Thank you.